Thank you, Michael. Thank you for organizing this amazing event. And thank you all for being here to create this amazing event. And thank you for your stamina so far. Technology has been changing the fire service ever since there's been a fire service. There's something fundamentally different about the way it's changing it now, though. Um, something new and, uh, and very different about this kind of change. Changes in software are changing the way we think and make strategic value decisions about the long-term future of the service that we all love. I've been privileged to participate in that change um, in a small way during my career. And I feel some duty to do what I can to steer that change in what I think is the right direction, which is the direction that preserves what's best about our service, which is our humanity. This is a picture of my grandfather. He was, uh, he was a pretty amazing guy. He was a very distinguished scientist with a 40-year career, a lot of awards, and a bunch of patents. He was also a volunteer firefighter in Larchmont, New York. And I had the privilege of um, spending about the eight, last eight months of his life with him uh, when Alzheimer's had uh, pretty much taken away his intellect. Uh, there wasn't much of the man left at that time. Um, and during that time, um, I was a new volunteer myself in, uh, in central Ohio, and during that time I thought it'd be fun to walk up to my station and show them the coolest, most exciting new thing in my life. Um, and I was amazed. We got there and he completely came back to life. He was utterly lucid, he was engaged, he was happy, he was talking to the guys, and he's like, oh, hey, there's the pumper over there. Oh, there's the truck. Gave me a little, little dissertation on the appropriate tactical placement of, of apparatus at a, at a structure fire. And so I started to wonder, I mean, I've actually wondered for a long time, what was it, what, what was it about our service that stayed with him for 60 years through that fog of dementia when he lost everything else? He'd lost all of the science that he'd worked so hard on. He didn't remember my mom's name, you know, three quarters of the time, and he barely knew who I was. But there was something so compelling about what he did 60 years ago with his, with his friends back in Larchmont, New York, that he remembered all that time, and it came back to him for that sort of miraculous few minutes. And I don't know, I, you know, I, I didn't inhabit my grandfather, and I still wonder, but I think it had something to do with the purity of that experience, the fact that we were all on the same team and that we were doing something good. It was a bunch of people helping people. I think that's what stayed with him. Another, another funny thing about my grandfather, he probably didn't think um, too much of my aspiration uh, to work in computers. Um, I remember him saying, computers, damn things are worthless. Anything I can do, you can do with a computer, I can do faster and better in my head. He might be kind of amazed by your iPhone. Um, Grandpa's uh, opinion notwithstanding, I feel blessed to have had a, a career so far that has had the one leg in the uh, software development field and the other in the volunteer fire service. My favorite project uh, to date is called Code 3 Simulator. Uh, it's a predictive modeling tool for assessing um, different strategies in fire and EMS. Um, it's uh, for assessing different deployment strategies. Um, it's a, it's a um, the technical word for it is a discrete event simulator, um, useful for making data-driven decisions in deployment strategies. That's a lot of words. Uh, there's a fire chief uh, down in the Bay Area who sums it up very succinctly and says, basically, it's SimCity for firefighters. You build a little virtual software fire department. Where are the stations located? How do we staff them? Where do we put rigs? Where do we put people? Uh, what are our dispatching policies, running districts, uh, partner agency agreements, how does all that stuff work? And you run, it on the, you run it on the computer really fast, and you can generate numbers and predictions about how the system's going to perform before you actually commit resources. Why is that important? Well, it turns out all of, all of us in this room, active in the fire service, we know our jurisdictions really well, and we have really pretty good intuitive understanding of, of what good deployment models are. Um, but it's actually a lot harder, it's a lot more complicated problem space than you think. Let's take a, a pretty simple example. This is Corvallis Fire Department where I'm from. Uh, several years ago before we closed the station, we had six stations, we had 19 people on duty typically. Um, 
maybe 17 pieces of apparatus, depending on how you count it. Um, that ought to be a pretty simple optimization problem. Let's, let's make it really simple. It's just, just how do we move the people and the, and the rigs around the stations. We're not going to bother with any of the fancy stuff like moving stations around or running district boundaries or anything like that. Just the simple stuff. Ought to be easy. Computer, tell us how to do this, right? Well, actually, that's wrong. Uh, it turns out that that really simple problem, if we had a thousand of, of these computers, uh, all running at the same time, it would take 80 times the lifetime of the Earth to calculate, to, to run all those scenarios and tell you what the best one was. So the answer is brilliant human intuition. You guys, we know our districts, we know how the fire service operates, we come up with pretty good ideas. The computer is just a tool with, with a simulator to help us test our ideas and evaluate them one against another and generate numbers and maps and, and, and w help us simplify this problem space in a way that we can understand easily and compare options and know what's good, what's better, and why they're better. More important, the other thing that's really good about this is it gives us a language that we can explain our jobs to people who don't understand them, um, to government stakeholders. We can say, they understand a map, and they say, oh, I understand why we need to do this. The numbers are better. Um, Another reason, and that's, that's tremendously exciting, that's a new tool in our arsenal of communication. Um, the other reason it's really exciting, it's really exciting for software engineers, is because there's no limit to what we can, how we can, the innovation here. There's a lot of places in software where basically uh, the last great idea happened about 10 years ago, and basically now we're just kind of filling in the holes. In this area, that's exactly the opposite is true. There's new papers getting published every week about technology that's going to make this better and better and better. And so, it's a tremendously exciting time to be a software engineer in fields like this. And I, on our team, we've got people who are volunteering to work on this because it's the coolest thing that we're doing. However, this leaves me with a bit of a concern and a, and a feeling of duty and responsibility to protect what is most valuable about the fire service. This technology is incredible at simplifying this complex decision space with numbers, data, charts, and maps, and helping us clarify our thinking about strategies. The problem, the danger, is in oversimplification. And, and the way I express the, the danger is this phrase, we not it. Um, a simple example, there really is no chart or number or map that, that really understands the importance of, of the feeling that you get when you sling the life pack over your shoulder on the engine call that's a code, and you're hustling up the sidewalk and you realize there's a lady kneeling there praying to you to save her husband. There's, there's no number or chart that quite captures that. I think we all have an intuitive understanding of what I mean when I say we and it. I think, and as firefighters, we're for the most part blessed to work in amazing we organizations. But, Nonetheless, I've put, up, I've put together this graphic that is very subjective. It's kind of based on my experience of some we and it organizations uh, with some diagnostic markers, the linguistic markers on the top and sort of modes of thought on the bottom. But I've got a little story that sort of may illustrate it from my software career. I, uh, in the 80s and early 90s, I worked for digital equipment, which was at the time the second largest computer company in the world. And it was legendary. It was um, known as you know, the company of 120,000 entrepreneurs. And from my experience, that was, that was true. I actually lived that life. I uh, had a day job. I was a software engineer and a development manager on a software product that was out in the field. And it was challenging and interesting. And I got involved with our research lab and hooked up with this midnight project. And literally three nights a week, I would like sleep under my desk and I'd sneak my dog past security so she could stay in the office with me. I was single at the time. And, um, and it was tremendously exciting. You know, I'd have high fives at three in the morning with the, with, the, with the team when we'd get something working. And we felt like we were changing the world. We were getting positive attention. And then digital hit about five bad quarters in a row. And the people at the top, the, the number of people at the top, handcuffed the CEO and pushed him aside and said, oh, gotta, the only thing we've got to do, we've got we to cut 8% out of the cost structure. 8%, cut 8%, cut 8%. And that trickled down to the senior managers, mid-level managers. And they went into the conference rooms and locked the door behind them. And they put paper over the glass in the door so that we couldn't see in. And they played the lifeboat game. And... We, meanwhile, were out in our workspaces, and we were told, you've got to be more innovative than ever. You've got to create the future. You've got you to 
dream, you know, dream big and execute hard. And um, the, meanwhile, they're inside the conference rooms deciding which ones of us they're going to huck out of the lifeboats. Um, so it didn't have quite the intended effect. And the tragedy was that of the 12 or 15 people I worked most closely with, every single one of us would have given up 12 or 15 percent of our salary in order to keep everybody in the lifeboats and keep that incredible we organization that we were part of. But instead, the opposite thing happened, and, and within a very short period of time, we were all the way over on the right side of this continuum, and I heard language like that, and everybody felt like this organization we used to love was our oppressor. Now, in the fire service, I hope we've never been all the way at that end of the spectrum. I hope it's never happened, but we've probably all felt the organization move from one direction to the other. Um, the good news is that the, te the technology I'm talking about here can be a force for good in this fight. And my observation is, for the most part, so far, it has been. We've got, we have, uh, we're a young product, um, it's very dynamic, we have 12 customers right now, and we're growing. Um, all of my 12 customers, I'm very proud to say, are using this, I think, in the right way. But let, let me, let me um, tell you a couple of quick stories. The first one concerns a, a large fire department in the Northwest. Um, and they had some really tough problems. They were had heavily, heavily, heavily overutilized, under-resourced, and um, yeah, just really hard. And there was, and in a, in a tense situation like that, you end up with just naturally some 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 conflict. I mean, the um, you know the suppression personnel, the attitude had sort of become, oh my God, what are the white shirts going to do to us now? and some, some distrust. And, and the chief stepped in and he did, he did a fairly bold and visionary thing. He said, we're going to solve this problem and we're going to solve it in a data-driven fashion. Um, furthermore, we're going to solve it as a team. So he formulated some strategies, overall strategic objectives, and said, this is, this is the direction. Then he brought in the IAFF, and the IAFF and the command staff attacked the problem together, and they've worked really hard. They evaluated 32 scenarios over a six-week period, they modeled, they, they simulated, they analyzed data, and they finally came down to a decent solution. There were, no, there were no great solutions to this problem, given the constraints, but they came to a decent solution that everybody could agree on, and they met the number. Most important, they were unified. I had a deputy chief come to me afterwards and say, I have never seen the union and the management team this aligned on any matter ever. And even better, I was, at a, I was at a social function several months later, and I ran into their union president, and he came up and he gave me a big hug, and he said, thank you. And that was the moment when I knew this technology could bring us together, and that it, it was a good thing. The other story I really like, much smaller fire department, opposite problem, crazy growth, and they knew they had to handle it, and they didn't know how uh, to stay ahead of the problem. Um, they knew they had to build a fire station. So we were training the folks in the software. And on the third day of training, one of the captains, uh, we'll call him Dave, shows up. Dave's kind of sheepish, and he's like, hmm, you know, uh, last night uh, I, was, I was doing my homework on the computer, and one of, my, one, of my, uh, one of my guys on my crew walked by and said, hey, what are you doing, Dave? And... Uh, Next thing I knew, it was uh, three in the morning, and we'd been, we'd been playing with these models for like four and a half hours. And we all laughed at Dave, and, and, but then Dave said, uh, but you know, one of my guys had this idea, and uh, we ran it, and uh, the numbers came out pretty good. What do you think? Did we make a mistake? And we looked at the numbers, and numbers held up. We did some auditing, I'm like, wow, that's a pretty good idea, Dave. And long story short, they're actually using this uh, for an 18 to 21 month transitional deployment model, uh, very cost effective, very performance, very excellent performance. Um, and that idea literally came from a firefighter. And that organization drew together and became more of a we by using this technology. So I'm, I'm really proud of those two stories. Um, and they show that there's a great deal of hope. Um, we all want to work as human beings, we all want to work in we organizations. So what, what can we do about it? Okay, so I'm a firefighter. Uh, what can I do about this? Well, first of all, you can say, you can go to your chief and you can say, Chief, this change is coming. I want to be part of it. I want to, I want to drive it in the right direction. I want us to become more of a we by using technology like this. Um, chief, when that person comes to you, say, yes, please. Thank you for volunteering. You're on the team. Um, that makes your organization stronger. It promotes your next generation. And it makes you more of a we. The other thing, Chief, is 
selectively, carefully, and appropriately involve your government stakeholders in this process. Explain to them what you're doing. Explain your, your goals, explain your metrics, show them the process, and let them ask questions, again, appropriately and selectively. Government leaders, government stakeholders, do demand data-driven decisions. It's your right, and it's also your obligation to your constituents. However, remember the limitations of data, and remember, ultimately, that the data is there to help guide a deeply human organization. Always remember the humanity. Vendors, like me, in this space, remember, again, that the data is to support and to, subvert, to serve and to grow a deeply human organization with a deeply human purpose. So, I'm here to ask you to talk to me. As, as this change happens in your organization, get in touch with me. That's my email. Um, find me after the event. Um, I want to hear from you about how to, how to help your organization be more human with planning technology. I'd like to close uh, with a quick story. Um, this is about another company officer. Uh, let's call him Dave, too. Um, I, uh, Dave was, uh, I was on the engine with Dave. And um, we get a call at about 11 o'clock at night, uh, difficulty breathing. And um, we arrive uh, to find a woman in mild to moderate um, distress. And she's kind of crumped. She's huddled up against the couch on the floor. And um, the other two guys on the engine are out getting ready for the medic to come in. They're about five minutes back. And Dave's kneeling on one side, and I'm on the other side. I'm finishing vitals and writing some notes. Vitals aren't too bad, um, but she looks really bad. She's just, she does not, she looks a lot worse than her clinical signs would indicate. And Dave's been around for a while, and he looks at her and he says, Ma'am, ma'am, what's going on? Pause. She looks, she looks at him, and she sees him, and she says, You know, my kids are on the other coast, and I see them maybe once a year. My husband's been gone two years, and I just don't want to do it anymore. And Dave takes another pause, and he leans forward a little bit, and he opens his arms like this. And she melts. She just melts. She just crumps in, head on his shoulder, hugs him. He hugs her, and she just starts silently to sob just a little bit. And then, and then, after a, a moment, she straightens back up a little bit, and she shakes it off, and she looks at both of us with these big eyes, and then she says, okay, okay. So we help her to her feet, and the guys from the medic show up, and with help, we walk her forward, and she steps up, she stands tall, and she walks with great courage and dignity and grace into what comes next in her life. That's what I love about this service, and that's why I ask that when we use data, let's always use it to build what's best about us, which is our humanity. Thanks.